everyone, welcome to the Biodiversity Lab at St. Joseph's University. In this lab, we house a wide variety of species of turtles and fish. Many of the animals we have are very rare in the wild, so by having them here, we help to protect them. While we like to look at all of our animals, most of what we do is study the animals to learn more about how they grow, how they think and behave, and how those things can change when different factors in their environment change. Today, we will be looking at two species snapping turtles, and darkling beetles, and learn more about their unique adaptations and habitats. All right, hi everyone. I'm here today in the biodiversity lab to talk to you guys a little bit about the adaptations of snapping turtles. So this guy right here is our snapping turtle and his scientific name is Caledra serpentina. He is considered a species of least concern, which means that there are a lot of him in the world. And if you wanted to find him out in the wild, you'd most likely be able to find him in Eastern North America. And so that would include places like here in Pennsylvania and the Philadelphia region, okay? So let's look at our snapping turtle for just a bit and think about some of the adaptations that this guy has. So remember that an adaptation is a characteristic that a living thing has that makes it so that it is well suited to live and survive in its environment. So when we look at our snapping turtle, I think the, the biggest thing we first notice that is common to both the snapping turtle and to many other turtle species, really all turtle species, is this really hard shell. So remember, this shell is going to be really helpful to the turtle for a couple of reasons. So first, the turtle has the shell uh, because it would make it very hard for a predator to attack this guy, right? It'd be very hard to break through that shell. And so that's a very good protective mechanism, as well as the turtle is able to bring its head and neck inside of the shell to protect it again from a possible um, predator. We also see that this guy here has um, some really long toenails on, on the bottom of each of its feet. And these are gonna be really helpful in enabling it to um, claw at a potential predator or at potential food. And then if we look at the face of our snapping turtle, we see that he has this really big kind of almost beak-like um, end, end of its face. Um, and that's going to enable it to have a really good, hard, sharp bite. And that's why you wouldn't want to get near a snapping turtle. So if, even if you were able to find one out in the wild, you want to keep a safe distance because these guys can really do some damage. And we're not going to see this here today, but these guys are also capable of really snapping their necks off to one side very quickly. And that again is going to be helpful in protecting it against predators and also in helping it to get the food that it needs. And then the final thing I want us to think about today is the colors that are on our snapping turtle. So if we notice, for the most part, the snapping turtle is pretty brown. The underside of the belly is a little bit almost cream colored. And when we look at our shell, we notice that the shell is also brown and has some algae or some really small plant life growing on it. And what's great about being built like this, having colors like this, is this enables the snapping turtle to be camouflage in its environment. So these guys are going to hang out in places like the woods where if we think about it, we have a lot of um, brown and green growth. And they can also be inside of things like lakes or ponds or streams, rivers, things like that, where it would be helpful to blend in with the ground below you. All right, thanks for listening guys. All right, so now we're gonna talk about darkling beetles. So if you guys think back to our rotting log um, lesson this spring in our forest ecosystem unit, you will remember seeing um, a variety of different bugs living inside our rotting logs. And one of them um, is the darkling beetle. So the reason that the darkling beetle was in our rotting log kits is because that's where you're likely to find a darkling beetle. So darkling beetles like to eat things that have already died so that we call them scavengers so they look for things that have already died and that's where they get their food so that's why you'll find them in rotting logs um, and you can also find them um, in other rotting areas or just crawling around in the soil because there's um, 
rotting plants and things like that in soil as well. So these guys are insects and as we can see here, um, they are in the lab here, they are on a log. This isn't a rotting log, it's just um, a dead log, but it's not really rotting, it's pretty dried out. But they have a lot of wet soil, so that's where they get a lot of their nutrition. But because they're living in the lab and we aren't able to keep a constant supply of that rotting material for them to eat, we also give them um, food just like we give the turtles so that they always have some source of nutrition. And just like anything else, they also have water. Now what's really interesting about this tank here, I'm not sure if we'll be able to see anyone else in here right now, um, but even though this tank was only set up to house the darkling beetles, because the soil came from outside, we also have some other um, animals living in here. So I was uh, watering this tank earlier today and I found um, a couple worms, I found some millipedes, um, and so there's a lot going on here. So it really is just like the model rotting log that we saw in our classroom. And if you were to find a darkling beetle out in the wild, you would see that their natural habitat is very similar to the rotting log that we saw in class, very similar to the tank setup we have here, and would be pretty wet with rotting material, and these insects would be living with a bunch of other animals, all of which like to feast on this rotting material.